hearts. And God, I thank you that you are, you are a good God. And we just want to bless you and thank you this morning. We thank you. We thank you for this country that we live in. And Father, I thank you that you take imperfect situations and you can turn them around. And I thank you that on the prayers of your people, you said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So we continue to pray that over our nation. We continue to pray that the leaders of our nation would, would lead um, with accountability and would lead uh, with the influence of our prayers in the Holy Spirit, that we can continue to be one nation under God, on God. And I thank you, Father God, for this morning. I thank you that your word will enter deep into our spirits. I thank you for everything that you have provided in your word for us. I thank you that we're finding out who we are. And then we're looking to see what we can do. And I thank you that you will just anoint the word this morning. I thank you that we have eyes to see and ears to hear. And we'll not just be hearers, but we'll be doers of the word. And we'll be blessed in that. Thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I titled it, You Are Loved. But you know how it is. I was thinking Valentine's Day, and I was thinking, that'd be a good title. I was thinking about, you know, maybe we should talk about love. But then I did a pastor on you. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be anything about the title. <laughs> so, but you are loved. I just want you to know that. And, and so um, love, I'll do, I'll do my introduction. Though. Love is not a feeling. And um, sometimes we do not feel love. You know God is not a feeling, and sometimes we don't feel God. Love is actually an action. You cannot demand love to be demonstrated on your terms. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, we find that love does not make demands. Love is something you experience, but it is more than emotion. And God has a lot to say about love. You know, he said that perfect love can he said that love covers a multitude of sins. He said that he first loved us so that we could love those around us. And he said that the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What a great love we can experience. And, and some of the greatest words spoken in the word of God about love were actually spoken when Jesus was facing betrayal. He knew what was coming. You know, sometimes when things happen in our lives, we don't see it coming. So we have to, hopefully we respond and we don't react. But whatever we do, we have a response to what happened. But Jesus knew ahead of time what was going to happen. And he still, he still taught the disciples and gave us God's, God's word for the new covenant, the new relationship, the new day that, that was coming. And, and he did that in the face of betrayal, desertion, abandonment, and in the foreshadowing, foreshadowing of the most horrific, embarrassing, and shameful, undeserved death. So when we, when we complain about our love life, <laughs> poor, you know, li listen to that. He was facing betrayal. He was facing desertion. He was going to be abandoned, even by God. And he was going to be embarrassed and shamed. And he still chose to do God's plan and to do that undeserved death. And that is really what love is all about. So this year, I wanted to look at who we are, how do we identify this year, and then what do we do? What do we do with that identification? In Weymouth, um, so we do know 1 John 3, 6, or, I'm sorry, John 3, 16, the redemptive plan of God to buy or redeem you back from Satan's kingdom delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of light. John 3, 16, we can quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not suffer, but should be saved. I know I messed that up a little bit. <laughs> but, but God so loved. And we talk about that. We talk about God so loved. And we talk about God gave. But think about the love of God. Romans 5, 5 said the love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. In the Weymouth New Testament, the translation says, and that this hope never disappoints. We've been disappointed before, haven't we? But this love and this hope never disappoints 
Because God's love for us floods our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. I want to read that again. The hope that we have never disappoints because God's love for us floods our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Love is a demonstration. It's an outflow. It's an outward expression of something deep and hidden on the inside. Often in counseling with married couples, this is an issue. The love is deep, but it is not demonstrated or expressed. And it seems to be hidden. It needs, maybe it needs a little bit of ignition, something to ignite it. The longer you're married, sometimes it takes a creative or thoughtful demonstration in order to be experienced, or dare say, even to be exposed. I'm feeling kind of funny here with that. having that, that microphone. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> so, so my husband, when we were first married, he didn't do all those things that I thought a husband was supposed to do. He did not act the way a husband was supposed to act. <laughs> How is a husband supposed to act? But, um, you know, he said, I just don't understand. What is your problem? I was like, well, you don't tell me you love me. <laughs> And you don't do this. And he says, and he was just, he, I, was, I was so surprised at how clueless he was. He says, what do you mean? You don't know that I love you? You should know that I love you when I come home every night. I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I work hard. And at that time, he was working for minimum wage. It was, believe it or not, for something an hour. And he said, I give you my check. <laughs> But somehow that just didn't feel like it was enough for me. I was like, you need to, you need to. And I had a list of things in my head. I didn't tell him. That never went well with him, but I had a list of things in my head. <laughs> but you know, you know, sometimes we do that to God. But God has proclaimed his love for us. He has. And he demonstrated it. He demonstrated it. He redeemed us out of the hand of the enemy. And he translated us. He delivered us from, and he translated us into. And now we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, flooding us with that love of God. Why? Because the word of God said, Jesus told the disciples, they'll know you are my disciples by your love. So we have something to, we have something to look at when we talk about love. Um, the Bible says in Galatians 3.3 3, that your faith, will work by love. Sometimes our faith is not working. Well, maybe we need to check up. Your faith works by love. So it is important that we check up on ourselves. We're really good at checking up on everybody else. <laughs> we can really, really, really tell you what we think. But how about that? He said that your faith works by love. So what does that mean? And I learned this. I learned this because um, right after Bible school, we went, we had to Little did I know our journey, but one of the first places we went to was, was Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And to me, that was like, oh my goodness, where am I? <laughs> and it was like a whole different world to me. And we had to live with somebody. We had gone from that apartment that I wasn't so happy with at first, and I learned to love, to living with somebody for the first time. We did that many times through life. But I observed something when I lived there. I observe that, you know, people cannot love. People sometimes are miserable, but you can't take that personal because people sometimes have things in their life they don't love themselves. If they don't love themselves and they have not been shown love, they don't know how to give it out. And the Bible commands us to love, so how are we going to do that? We are going to do it in the love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts because I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, the book of John, and I th thought about the three themes, light, life, and love. And I thought about, you know, we were walking in darkness. We were ignorant of God. We didn't know him. Some, some of us were, like, alienated from him. And, and, and then God put out light. And, you know, when, when, light, when you see light, and you're walking even in a little bit of darkness, you're always kind of looking like you want to walk towards that light. So he shed his light. He sent the light of the world, Jesus. And so we walked toward that light. One of the first sermons we heard in the Presbyterian church, we had to go listen to the sermons because we were there to be 
to set up, clean up, take down, and security. And also, there were a lot of elderly, so we were there to make sure everybody was okay. So we sat through the services. And, um, and one of the first times they came back from one of the conferences, it was a woman preacher. And she came back from the conference, and she talked about that she learned that there was a light at the end, and, and maybe, maybe we would make it if we, if we could just follow that light. And she talked, she talked more about, I had to give my husband the elbow. She talked more about the number that she was, number 565 at the conference. That was her identity at that conference. She was number 565. <laughs> she was representing the church. And I guess there were a lot of people there because she was number 565. <laughs> and so, but, but she did not even know how to communicate being born again and did not, sadly, did not know if she was born again. And she was a representative of the church sharing with us the conference. And we're going to Bible school, and we're hearing a whole different message of Bible school. And I sat there, and he still, years later, said, I just can't believe that we talked about the light, that we might not even get there, but if we could just see the light. But, you know, we have the light. We have the light of God's word. We have the light of the Holy Spirit anointing on the inside of us. We have that life of God. So when we went to the light, I'll, get, I'll, I'll walk with her that far. <laughs> when, we, when we went to the light, guess what we did? We embraced that light. We embraced that knowledge of God. We became intimate with God, and he gave us his life and his nature. We were born of God. So who are we? I know that this is basic, but you are born of God. Now, since I'm a woman, I say I am the daughter. I am the highly favored daughter of the Most High God. <laughs> you can say it your way if you're a guy. But, um, but that's who I am. That's who I am. And therefore, I'm going to respond that way. And I am also going to represent God from that, from that viewpoint. So um, we, we respond to the light. It dispels our darkness. The more we give our life and give parts of our life to God, the more light that comes in. He dispels our darkness. We experience the life and nature of God. We experience his ability. We exp God is love. That's a statement of fact in the word of God. God is God is. It's something, it's a part of his being. He is love. You know, and it never goes away. He's always love. So if we are born of God, guess what? We are born of love. And we have a responsibility to represent God in the way that we walk out that love of God. So as God has poured his love into us, we can now love ourselves because we see that image of God. And then we can walk out his love to the people around us. And that's really the gospel. That's as simple as it is. So um, the world, in John 13, 35, Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by the love that you demonstrate to each other. The world will know. They won't, they won't wonder. They will know that you are my disciples by the way that you demonstrated to each other. So then I got to thinking about that, and I thought, how can I know, and how can I be sure? And I thought, maybe somebody will ask me this question if I talk to them about God. Maybe they'll say to me, well, how can I know? How can I be assured that God loves me? And you, I've heard that before. Because there, there's sometimes I've shared something with people, and they say, but you don't know me. I am so awful, or I've done something so awful, or my background is this. And no, God didn't put, he didn't put restraints on that. I know that God loves me, and he loves you, because he says so in his word. So we talked about that. We need to get acquainted with God and his word. God's word, the Bible, scripture, reveals God to us. Which brings us to the subject of meditation. How are you going to know what God says? You have to hear him. How are you going to know what I say? If you can't hear me, you're going to have to read my lips or you're going to have to try to figure out what I'm saying or I'm going to have to put it up on the screen and you're going to look at it and read it and you'll know what I'm saying. So how do we know? Some people say, I don't hear God. I don't know how to hear God. 
I don't know if God ever speaks to me. Yes, he does. He does. He has a lot to say. And um, he says it in his word. So we need to get acquainted with God in his word. In Joshua 1.8, and we've looked at this a while, it says, let's just read it out of the King James. Joshua 1.8. Oh, my goodness. My Bible fell out of the cover, and now it's upside down. <laughs> Joshua 1.8. Now I'm on the spot, huh? Where is it? Joshua 1 8. I bet we could probably quote it, but let's read it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So it is an if-then proposition. If you don't let it depart out of your mouth, if you meditate in it constantly, day and night, and you do what? You observe to do it. Then it will make your way prosperous, and you'll have good success. So where did that, where was that spoken? That was spoken to Joshua. Mo and in the Bible, it just says that Moses is dead. I'm like, oh. Oh, <laughs> that's how it plainly says it in the King James. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so, but God had Moses transfer his anointing onto Joshua. And then God talked to Joshua. And he said, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. But he said, this is what you need to do. Be strong, be courageous. And he said, pay attention to my word and my covenant. So one of the translations said that you will be able to deal wisely in the affairs of life. You cannot develop spiritual wisdom without meditation in God's word. Why? This is how God communicates with you, through his words, and they're found in the Bible. You might ask, okay, then how can I understand it? Especially King James, thee, thou, <laughs> therefore, wherefore. How can I understand it? The Holy Spirit is the author, and it is his job to teach you. And and lead you into all truth. In the days that we live now, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what's true. But we can always, 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 always know that God's word is true. We can always, always, always know that God is faithful. And he said that he will lead us into truth. So in John 15, 5, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So if you need some revelation of God, and if you're abiding in him, spending time with him, it says, you know that word abide? It actually means make God your, your hangout. Make him your dwelling place. It actually has the word tent in some of the uh, translations. So 1 John 2, 20 and 27 says this. It says that, and we know that we've had an anointing sealed with it in us by the Holy Spirit. In verse 20, it says, but you have an unction. That's another word for anointing. You have an unction. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Verse 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abides in you. So you don't have to look all over the place. You don't have to go to the library and go through that card catalog that I don't even know how to maneuver anymore because I learned how to Google. <laughs> you, have to, you have to go there. You don't have to go there. It says that you can find it in him, and he's in you. The anointing that's in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. I love when God tells me that he doesn't lie to me. I love it. <laughs> Even as he has taught you, shall abide in him. So you abide in God. How do you abide in God? You meditate. You meditate in his word. So the first step to training your spirit and hearing the voice of God is to meditate in his word. You know, you can train. Um, I learned how to train a dog. I did not know what a dog was on the inside of a house. We had it outside dogs when we were growing up. I had to learn, how do you do a dog? <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. You got to get out and you got to take that dog to walk every couple hours. <laughs> so, so you don't have an accident in the house. And then, you know, there was different things. You don't leave, well, I already told you a story. You don't leave food out. 
<laughs> and so there's lots of things. They trained me, the dogs. <laughs> and, so, and so you have to train. You have to train children. You have to train yourself. You have to train your body. If you want a strong physical body, you have to train it. You have to train your mind. That's why we go to school. But guess what? You are a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a body. You have to train your spirit. And God won't do that for you. Just like nobody else will exercise for you. Nobody else will diet for you. You have to do that yourself. So we just haven't been told sometimes. Or, or we just kind of said, yeah, I know that. But you have a spirit that you're responsible for. So the first thing you need to do with that spirit to train it is you have to meditate in the Word of God. And in the book of Joshua, it says you'll know how to deal wisely in the affairs of life. And as we were going through Proverbs last year in Bible study, we found all kinds of interesting things about life in the book of Proverbs. And so we can find this is how God communicates with us through his word, found in the Bible. What's the next step? Now that you've meditated in the word of God, you have to take the next step. Now tell me if you've ever heard this. You have to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. James 1.22. James 1.22, and we know it by heart. I know we do. But it's very good sometimes to go and read it James, and hear yourself read it. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. You can deceive yourself. That's a scary thought. You can deceive yourself. You know, I've thought about people deceiving me, but I'm like, I can deceive myself. Yes, I can. I can tell myself I'm okay. I'm doing just great. <laughs> but maybe I'm not. So how do I find out? I am a doer of the word of God. I do what it says. I don't just hear it. I don't just read it. Because, you know, step one was meditate. Well, you're not good to go after you meditate it. You have to do something. It said observe to do in the book of Joshua. So we'll be to practice to be a doer of the word of God. It's important to take that step. You are born again of God. I told you that. God is a spirit. In John 4, 24, it says that God wants, desires us to worship him in spirit and in truth. He desires something deep out of us. He doesn't like just, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. You know, God is good. God is great. You know, the things we pray over our food. He, he, he wants something a little deeper than that. I wanted something a little deeper from my husband than just he came home. Later on, when he had some struggles, I found out that was a good thing when he came home. <laughs> Maybe I should have been happy about that. And so, and so um, you're born of God. God will use your own spirit to guide you. You might ask, how does this take place? How does God use my spirit to guide me? That's where we get to the point that we have to learn how to train our human spirit without you realizing it. We've already looked at two of the four ways that this can be accomplished. You can train your spirit. So you know how to do your body. I mean, you've been doing it for how many years? You know how to do it. Sometimes we don't do it right, but we know how to do it. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I grew up in church, and I was never challenged to train my spirit. I barely even knew that I had a spirit. I knew that I, was, I had a spirit in that, that God, I was born again, and that I was responsible to live what God said in his word, to represent him. I was responsible to share it with people. And then I would go to heaven. And that's about as deep as I went. And so I mostly concentrated on doing good, being good, doing good, being good, doing the good things that God said to do. And I exhausted myself. I about made myself crazy. But guess what? God didn't make it to be that way. So the third thing that you do with the word of God is you give it first place. You give it first place. We often some we often laugh and say, I guess I'll pray about that now. What? <laughs> I guess I'll pray about that now. <laughs> After we're all stressed out. How about we do that first? Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. Another favorite scripture, familiar scripture. We've probably looked at it already. But let's look at it again. Because it is very good to look at God's word. Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, King James. My son, 
my daughter, attend to my words. Incline your ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. So we all experience a lot of distractions, a lot of noise, a lot of stuff. People always want to share their opinions with you. They want to share their advice, especially if you live in a family. Growing up in a family, I always knew certain things because, you know, there was that hierarchy. Mom and dad, because I was the oldest, that was a cool thing sometimes. <laughs> and then the kids, you know, and then the cousins, everybody was involved in what you did. But people, people will want to share with you, and sometimes, you know, we are supposed to we learn to communion. We're supposed to in honor prefer one another. We're supposed to value each other. But you know what? You have to learn that God loves you. You're loved of God. Then you can love others. And then you can love God. Because we, 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 you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't know that you're loved, you cannot, cannot, cannot love somebody because you don't know that you're loved. It's hard to give out something you don't have. But when you have it and it's in the reserve somewhere, you got to pull it over there to where it's active in you. So we all experience a lot of noise and distraction. However, an essential part of training the spiritual man is learning to listen to what God's word has to say to us. It is giving God's word first place in our lives. So I was thinking about that. Because we're coming into Lent, in, um, and I know that, that like the Catholics do the cross with ashes. And since I have a birthmark right there, it used to be very, very interesting around this time of the year at school because they tried to figure out, what is that mark on her head? <laughs> it doesn't look like ashes. What kind of church does she go to? Because <laughs> I usually had it covered up. I didn't like people to see it. And, um, so, so what do we do at Lent? And I, I, we, in our church, we didn't do something special for Lent. We just acknowledged. So through the years, with, um, we did some different things. When we moved to a different town, we would get involved with the different ministries in that town. And sometimes we shared, like one time we shared the, the seven sayings of Christ, and each pastor got to do one. And there would be like, I never knew what a Maundy Thursday was. I had no clue what that was. I went to my, mom, my grandma's Presbyterian church, and I thought, oh, I know what Good Friday is. I know what Resurrection Sunday is. What is Maundy Thursday? And, so, and so, so we have all of these traditions and all of these things that we pay attention to. But at Lent, people give up something, and they just lay it aside so that they can give God something. And they'll, and they'll talk about maybe fasting something so that they can have. And I knew my, my husband's family was, um, was uh, Episcopalian, so if we visited his grandma, Friday was fish during, during that time. It was always fish. I did not know what, I, we didn't have fish at my house growing up. So I decided that fish was an acquired taste and then God put me in New England. So I assumed in New England, everybody loved seafood. I found out they don't, so it's okay. And, so, and I'm learning, I'm learning seafood. But, um, but at Lent, we would fast something or put something aside and um, give attention to that season and what, what happened. So we, we, we gave attention to that, but only at Lent, you know. And, and then after that, we just did whatever we wanted. Well, it's great to have those times that you set something, you know, you give attention to it, like, you know, Easter and Christmas. But I'm talking about giving God's word first place in your life every day, not just on a holiday. And then we listen to it, we read it, we memorize it. We, we meditate on it. We mutter it. We were talking about that. Meditation actually means mutter. And, um, and the Israelites, they murmur. Excuse me. I was trying to figure out everything out this morning. I thought a mint would be a good idea, but <laughs> no. And so, and so um, they murmured. They murmured. And they, they did not get to walk into the promised land. So, you know, God has a lot in his word for us, but we will not be able to walk in our fullness of what he has for us. He loves us. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us more than we can even imagine. 
But we can't enjoy that love if we don't know that it's available and we don't walk and experience it. So in verse 20 that we just read, it said, incline thine ear unto it. Anytime the word of God is being read aloud, be careful to give attention to its words. Listen to it. In verse 21, it says, do not let the words of God depart from your eyes. In other words, spend time alone reading the word of God. Let God speak to you. Read it. Let it sink deep into your thoughts and your heart. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Some people don't do memory. I don't think God gets too concerned about what you do. I think he just wants you to engage with him, you know? Sometimes in relationships, it's like, oh, but I just, I just need a little bit of engagement. You know, don't, don't, don't watch the TV. Talk to me. <laughs> I mean, you know, we think about these things when we, when we in, relate with each other. But somehow we just check our brains out at the door when we come to God and we act like, no, God is a person. We're made in his image. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to give everything that he has and share it with us. And we need, to, we need to press into him. So memorize and meditate on it. Get it deep down on the inside of you. Keep it in the midst of your heart. And if you do those three things, you will find that God's words are what? Verse 22. God's words will then be life and help to all your flesh. Your physical body can walk in health. Your emotions and your mental health will come into a wellness. Come in, you'll become whole. You'll become, you'll become, the word perfected is used in some ways. And when I hear the word perfected, I'm always thinking I got to perfect something. I got to work on something else. <laughs> oh, no. No, the word perfected means you become complete. And we talked about that a couple of months ago. Complete. We can be complete in him. So the last step to train your human spirit is to be led by the Spirit of God. After you've done these steps, after you have looked to his word, meditated in it, practiced it, gave it first place, you can now hear God. You can hear him. He's quiet. He's not really loud usually, but you can hear him. You've put the distractions aside. You've put him front and center, given him his attention. When I talk, I always tell you this. When I talk to the girls on the phone, they can tell when I'm distracted, even when they're not looking at me. Mom, I don't think you're listening. <laughs> I'm thinking, how can they know? I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to multitask. They're all good multitaskers. I'm not. So I was trying to multitask while I was listening. <laughs> and they're like, they're pretty sure I'm not hearing a thing they said. <laughs> so, so too often, that's how we treat God, though. And that's what I wanted to bring your attention to. So give God first place. You'll learn to know his, you'll learn to know his voice, just like you learn to know your family member's voice. You learn to know their voices. You learn to know God's voice, and it'll speak inside of you. And then you can do what he says, because it says in the word of God that those that are children of God expect to be led by the spirit of God. So the last step to train, train your human spirit is to be led by the spirit of God, is to instantly obey the voice of your spirit. And we're going to look at that in Romans 8, verses 14 to 17. Instantly obey the voice of your spirit. Your spirit has a voice. Have you ever heard your thoughts, your mind? Oh, have you ever had your emotions take over you? They have very loud voices. Your spirit has a voice. In Romans 4, 4 I'm sorry, Romans 8, 14 to 17, it says this. It says, Therefore, brethren, wait a second. Let me see if I have the right one. Yeah. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, so children of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So you are what? You're a child of God. And since he's the king of kings and lord of lords, you are an heir of God. You've got an inheritance going on. And so since Jesus already died, you get to cash 
in on that inheritance. And then you get to live in that life of God on the inside of you. And when you do these steps, let's say, what were they? These steps were meditation on the Word of God, practicing and being a doer of the Word of God, giving the Word of God first place, not last place, and listening to it, walking it out, instantly obeying the voice of your spirit. When we train our spirit, God will use our own spirit to guide us. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you went to ask somebody else, what should I do about this situation? And they told you, and you did what they said, and oh boy, <laughs> it was trouble. Well, God promises that you will know how to deal wisely in the affairs of life. He said that he will give you knowledge. He said that he will help you understand. I am so proud of myself. I put my own ink ribbons in my printer yesterday. I wanted to ask somebody to help me because that was something my husband always did. I did it, and it worked. <laughs> I felt so empowered. <laughs> so, you know, I like those E words. I like education. I like empowerment. I like enlightenment. We get all those things. We get all those things in our package, our God package. So ask him. Ask him, I need some enlightenment, God. I need some, I need some wisdom. I need to understand this. I don't understand. Well, if the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, I really think that he can explain it to you. Yeah? And then I need, I need to be empowered. I've got some things going on that I just don't know if I can handle this. He is that power to you. He is the wisdom and power of God. The anointing. We read in 1 John, it's the anointing, the unction living on the inside of you. On the inside of you. You don't have to have gas in your car to go find it somewhere. And you don't have to have GPS and get lost. No, it's on the inside of you. So you need to look deep on the inside of you. And you will find what you need for everyday life. Sometimes we think God is, I guess we think God is not for everyday life. We think, oh, he's for when those big boomers happen or, you know, those life events or those special decisions that we have to make. No, he wants to be involved in your life every day. And that's why my loss was so big. It wasn't that we had a perfect life. It wasn't that we had a perfect marriage. But 41 plus years, and then lots of those years were 24-7. We learned, and we were totally different. <laughs> but we learned how to flow together and live together and how to surround each other and uphold so that your strength is my weakness, my weakness is your strength. It was called teamwork. So I want you to know that you have teamwork. You have the Holy Spirit. You have that. And you have the Word of God as your instruction. And you can, you can know what to do. And you can be able to do it, empowered to do it. So you can know. You can be educated, instructed, enlightened. You can be empowered. And you can go out and do exploits for God. He said we could do that. So um, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 in the Passion so I, I titled the sermon, You Are Loved, because you know what? If we're going to go forward in the church this year, and we're going to share God with people, we need to know some things. One thing we need to know is that we are loved. Because it's going to be very hard for us to show love, especially to people that, quote, unquote, don't deserve it, or, quote, unquote, don't treat us right. You don't get to have life on your own terms. You don't get to have love on your own terms sometimes. But you know what? I think that's why we get so mad at God. He wants things on his terms, and we're like, how dare God want things on his terms? <laughs> and yet our whole life we live, it's got to be my way. <laughs> you know, Everything's not going to be okay unless it's my way. And um, so we need to turn that around in our life. In Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, and um, this is kind of like my benediction. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 in the Passion Translation, it says this. So I, it's, it's called Paul Prays for Love to Overflow. Paul was an amazing man in ministry gift to the body of Christ. He prayed a lot. And this is one of his prayers. And this is a prayer that we can pray for each other. And we often pray for you guys in the church. And I've seen this prayer work personally with different people in my life. 
So if, you, if you're stuck, not, not ever fun to be stuck, not ever fun to feel like you're stupid or you don't know what to do, go to, go to Ephesians 3, verse 14. So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Did you hear that? Do you hear, did you hear what you have on the inside of you? I pray that he would unveil, enlighten you, within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor. He loves you. Until supernatural strength floods your innermost being, deep, deep down, with his divine might and his explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you, and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Did you hear that? God wants to, he wants you to be his resting place. We talked about that last week. He wants to surround you and bring you in and, and do that with you. And it says here that, um, it says that he will be released deep inside you in the resting place of his love. He wants to rest his love inside of you. You're going to be his resting place. Did you ever have a like a child put their head on your lap? I mean, it just it just feels good. Yeah, he wants to be the resting place of your of his love, and it will become the very source and root of your life. You need to be rooted and grounded in love. It says in the Word of God. Then, so then here's these are if thens. Then you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences: the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all of its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. I want to read that to you again. You will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love. Endless. Beyond measurement. That transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you. Why does it do that? Why does he pour his love into you? Until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. I just don't know what God wants for me. I just don't know what God's will is. I just don't know if God even cares about me. I think it says you can be filled with overflowing with the fullness of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather be filled with God if if there is a God, if, let's just say if, if there's a God, hello, I want to be filled with the fullness of him, don't you? And so never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. His miraculous power constantly energizes you. So now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. That's a prayer. You can read it out of your Bible. This was just out of the Passion. Now, what are we doing? What are we doing in church today? Well, we, well you opened up with worship. And we're going to close with, now we offer up to God all the glorious praise that rises from every church and every generation through Jesus Christ and all that will yet be manifest through time and eternity. Amen. So my prayer is that 
if you will press into that love of God, you will not be disappointed. It will not make you ashamed. You will not feel abandoned. You will not be alone. You will not be disappointed. You will have the energy, the life, the ability, the love of God without any boundaries. And when you get so full of that, witnessing is not hard, okay? We've, we've made everything so hard. It should be natural. It'll just be, it'll just come out of you. And I've had that experience with lots of you. You have done so many things to come alongside of me and to help me and to, to help me because I'm missing something, to help complete me. But I want you to know that people will never, never make you complete. And people go away. But God is forever, ever, ever on the inside of you. And he will always, always, always love you. And he will strengthen you and he will make you smart. So I want you to just meditate on those steps and those ways. I want you to start training your spirit because we got work to do. Amen? We can't do the work unless we have that energy, unless we're empowered, unless we have the knowledge and the wisdom, and unless we experience God and his unconditional love, then we can give it out and we can give glory to God. That's how you give glory to God. You pay attention to his word, you meditate in it, and then you do, you do. We do a lot of doing, but let's do what the word of God says, amen. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is not complicated, but your word does require some attention. It does require that we hear it, listen to it, give reverence to it, and then do it. But you didn't leave us without help. You gave us the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the unction, the anointing. And I thank you that as we go out of here this morning, we go out in that anointing and that unction of God. And I thank you that everything we encounter this week, we will encounter it, laying it before you and learning, learning to be training our spirit to walk and be led by the Spirit of God, who is truth. In Jesus' name, amen.